Yes, we are live now. Okay. So, can I start? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, let me start the session. Uh, good evening to uh, all the participants joining here and our uh, uh, respected uh, speakers, sir. Uh, I welcome you to yet another session of I Technical Lecture Series. Uh, which is uh, uh, serial number 22. The title of the lecture today is Bikeyam, an open source toolkit for developing speech technology in Indic languages. Today we have with us our speakers uh, from uh, joining from NOIDA, who is a senior research engineer at GAN.ai. Uh, the abstract of the uh, this session is Bikeyam is an end-to-end -end toolkit for speech recognition in Indic languages. India is home to almost 121 languages and around 125 crore speakers, yet most of them are low resource languages in terms of data and pre-trained models. Through Bikeyans, we introduce automatic data pipelines for data creation, model training, model evaluation, and deployment. In Bikeyans, we are creating 14,000 hours of speech data in 23 Indic languages and train wave to dot we have to make 2.0 based pre trained models. These pre trained models are, are then uh, fine tuned to create state of the art speech recognition models for 18 Indic languages, which are followed by language models and punctuation restoration models. Uh, they are open They open source all these uh, resources with, with the mission to that this will inspire the speech community to develop speech first applications using ASR models in Indic languages. A brief introduction to our speaker here. Uh, Anirudh is working as a senior research uh, engineer at GAN.ai. He works primarily on problems related to speech and NLP. He is also the maintainer of Bikeyams, which is an open source project providing recipes for creating state-of-the-art speech recognition models for Indic languages. Anirudh has completed his BTEC in mechanical engineering from, from VIT in 2013. He has completed his master's in applied mathematics and computational physics as an Erasmus Munda scholar from several European universities. He has also written his master's thesis at uh, uh, Frey University at Berlin, if I'm uh, correctly pronouncing, in 2015 in computational biophysics. He was also an uh, MIT ACS Global Link uh, scholar in 2012, for which he received a letter of appreciation from the Prime Minister of Canada for his research work. Before his job, he has worked as a researcher in the Department of Theoretical Physics at the same university, Berlin, to understand hydration interaction between lipid membranes using large-scale molecular dynamic simulation. I, I welcome you to our uh, 22nd lecture of uh, I. Uh, this panel is open to you now. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for the warm introduction. Uh, so I am Anirudh. Uh, I've been working in for, for the, in the speech space for the past three years. Uh, this project is also almost three years old now. Uh, so I'll be taking you through this journey of how we started, what we envisioned, and what we have developed uh, to share our journey with you uh, so that you can also use these open source tools and contribute to them, uh, evaluate them, and you know uh, even build more tools for Wakyansh or possibly your own toolkits, whatever works. So thanks a lot for attending today. So when we started working uh, uh, in this in this project, which was almost three years ago now, uh, this project was done in collaboration with Step Foundation, uh, which is a foundation, not for profit foundation, uh, which uh, which is funded by Nandan Lekani, and. Uh, there were not many resources for you know Indian languages in the ASR space available. Uh, so if you want to train models, if you want to evaluate models, data, it was not available. And but if you look for other languages like English or even Mandarin, uh, there is so much available, right? I mean, from libre speech data to to there are so many data sets. Ted, Liam, you you name it, they have it. So. A researcher or 
any person like us, you know, wouldn't go anywhere without data. So that was the starting point. This, uh, that why do so many Indian languages lag behind? Although the number of speakers we have is so so many. Like if we combine uh, Indian language speakers, like Hindi, Bengali, Telugu, Tamil, I am taking these numbers uh, by the number of speakers as the first language. You know, so we are so many in number, but the resources were so low. So that is what motivated us to start this uh, project. And uh, if you look at it, India's population, 90% of India's population uses a regional language to conduct their day-to-day -day activities, right? Uh, most of the people, many people don't know how to write or interact with a mobile phone. And in this case, for using voice technology even becomes more uh, useful and it, it breaks barriers of digital, digital inclusion and whatnot, right? So one thing I already pointed out that there were many challenges in a journey and one of the most challenging part was there was no open data in any Indic languages, right? Or hardly any data. If you want to train state of the art uh, speech recognition models for you know a lot of Indian languages, there was no data. Wide segments of our population is, was not represented in that data if some was even present. Uh, most of the Ing Indians are bilingual in nature, at least, right? We speak our mother tongue and English and maybe some other language of where we live or study or, you know, things like that. So no, no data set contained so much diversity uh, that you, you will be able to train such a good model for particularly Indian accents. Uh, there was a lack of focus on low resource, low resource languages, languages in terms, terms of uh, number of speakers even inside India. So like if languages like Tamil, Hindi, Bengali, you know, if these languages don't have, you know, resources, what can we think about the languages like maybe Maithili or Marwari or Dogri, you know, uh, the list is endless as we all know. And uh, there were not many things uh, which one could do without data or tools, right? And even if you looked at uh, AI tools for, developed by Google or any other big company, uh, they maybe had, you know, some four or five Indian languages, maybe some had 10 Indian languages in their API store, but all their, all that technology was contained with them. Uh, it was not democratized. Nobody knew how they train their models and you have to pay them to, you know, uh, use their tools uh, and for our own languages. So we wanted to take this hegemony of uh, concentrated power with big tech. Now, most of you might already know, but I'll just uh, give a brief overview, like what is automatic speech recognition, uh, simply saying it is giving a machine the ability to understand spoken language or sound, right? So if you have an audio wave, an ASR engine is basically something, uh, it can be a bunch of utilities. Uh, it has seen a lot of development from, you know, HMM based models to end-to-end -end modeling, which we did. Uh, and basically it just converts audio waves to, you know, text. And this is how mostly humans understand uh, speech as well. Uh, and on this text, you can do a lot of, you know, processing and NLP tasks to enhance this output. And I'll talk about what we did, uh, but in a nutshell, this is speech recognition, right? Giving the machine the ability to understand sound. Now, what is Vakyansh? Uh, Vakyansh is a framework that contains recipes to create speech recognition systems for index languages. Uh, notice the uh, emphasis on systems and not just models. So we are creating systems here to, you know, scrape data, create data for model training, uh, deploying your models, even, you know, utilities for enhanced output like automatic punctuation, multilingual subtitling, a domain adaptation. So we have developed a lot of bunch, a bunch of tools and techniques which one can use from the start till the end to deploy their models. So uh, you don't have to go through that whole journey again and don't have to start from zero, right? So it's not just ASR models, but a whole bunch of tools and tricks to deploy them efficiently, maybe use them in other use cases. Interested readers can also look at this uh, paper uh, we have on archive. So let me just describe first the overall process, what it looks like. So the first step is uh, data collection, right? Then we do something called data validation. Then we do some data processing and filtering. And the last comes the experiments, which is the training model part and, you know, fine tuning and doing whatnot. So when we are mostly in an, in an academic setting or, you know, in research labs, 
the first three things, the data collection, the data validation and data processing filtering is uh, we don't do it usually, right? Usually we have a data set and we just take it and we try to benchmark different model techniques to uh, train ASR models and see which techniques works best. Uh, but if you want to train ASR models, uh, which are current state of the art, uh, they require a lot of data if you are going for end-to-end -end networks and uh, somebody had to tackle this, right? So what we did was we created a framework to do all this. So data collection, what we did was uh, we developed crawlers which put search for open source audio and video uh, all over the internet, YouTube, archive. There are many, many things. There are so many government data sources which are open, uh, which nobody was using, which we are able to collect. And uh, once we have them, uh, usually these audios are pretty long, right? They can be a 10 minute audio, 30 minute audio, or, you know, speeches can be, you know, even one hour. Uh, so we had to basically chunk it. There are many ways to chunk audio, right? How do we make it shorter? Because that is the uh, size we require for ASR model training, which is the end goal, right? So we can do it in two ways. One way is basically we chunk the audio at regular intervals. Uh, but what we thought, what we saw there was that sometimes the word endings were not accurate, right? The data was getting chunked at points in which the speaker was already speaking. So we use a voice activity detection. Uh, this is again open source model uh, by Google uh, WebRTC VAD, uh, basically to chunk it so that voice activity is contained within chunks. And if some chunks are then shorter or longer, we basically, you know, uh, do some manual uh, intervention to basically see that chunks are of good size. Now the next is data validation. You have so much data coming in from your crawlers. Uh, of course, uh, you cannot wait for you know uh, people to come and see and ver verify it, right? We did everything uh, uh, like all the data collection and everything within almost like one and a half years. So if if that process was manual, uh, which we were initially doing, uh, we 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 came to you know a conclusion that this is not scalable. Uh, if you want to collect large data sets at scale, you need to automate the process. You cannot rely on human intervention all the time. Uh, so basically we tech, uh, developed some tools to filter out data, right? And one was language identification. So if data is coming, even if you are searching with a particular keyword that you just want maybe Hindi data, uh, from the internet, anything can come, you know, it is coming from the wild. So you have to make some sure of, you know, quality checks, some kind of quality checks so that uh, your your data sanity is maintained, right? And one of the thing is called language identification from audio. Uh, so we we saw that even when you are searching for Hindi data or you know any other data, sometimes a lot of other languages were present. And we decided to tackle this by creating language identification tools. Uh, and what we did was we basically created a bunch of tools uh, of Hindi versus non-Hindi or, you know, Tamil versus non-Tamil or Bengali versus non-Bengali or, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, just a two language classifier uh, so that it can uh, handle the complexity. And then we basically, what we did was we took a ResNet 50. It's a very famous computer vision model uh, as the backbone. We converted our audio chunks to mel spectrograms and we passed it through a ResNet 50 and we trained a basic classifier uh, to on the mel spectrograms, right? And it worked for us. Uh, it, it was giving good, good accuracy so that we could use it. And that is how we tackled language identification. The second was also uh, songs and music identification. So this was also important uh, because songs and music can also uh, deter the quality of speech data uh, because the kind of uh, like speech which is present in songs, it is not the kind of speech that we use in daily conversation, right? Usually uh, the phonemes are stretched or, you know, uh, there, there's so much music in the background, maybe the ASR models will not be able to uh, tackle that. So you need to make sure that such kind of samples are also not included while training, right? And again, if you do this manually, uh, you have to listen to each and every other chunk, which is not possible, right? So we again developed a CNN based classifier. It had some fo form of attention also at the end. Uh, it was all these techniques were already there in papers. We just took them and implemented them, right? Uh, we didn't develop these techniques on our own, uh, some of them. Uh, and we basically just took them, implemented them, and saw that, okay, that works for us, and we took it, right? 
The next is also uh, something known as a signal to noise ratio. Uh, so sometimes a lot of maybe kind different kind of noises can be present in your audio. Uh, maybe a white noise or a pink noise, or you know maybe just a fan in the background, and it can be very bad for uh, data. Uh, so we thought of filtering out those kind of chunks as well. Uh, so we did a signal to noise ratio check at, in the last. And reject, re rejected every anything that was less than twenty, basically using a WADA SNR. So that was how we basically validated data. Now the next was data processing and filtering part. Uh, so you have all this data, and you, you you up till now you have some surety about the language and the kind of maybe noise or not, it doesn't contain noise. Uh, but you need more information to train models, right? Uh, one of the key aspects in training any ASR model uh, is that you want it to be as diverse as possible in the sense that it should work for a lot of people, right? If your ASR model is only working for maybe 50 people or 100 people, uh, maybe it is good for some use case, uh, but we were developing something uh, for a general use case. So in that case, it doesn't work, right? So we had to make sure uh, that we have enough speakers in our data set and these audios are coming in and you don't know the speakers. So how do we estimate the speakers, right? That was the problem statement, the first problem statement, right? So what we did was basically uh, we uh, passed this. So all these chunks which are coming in, uh, there's another E2E loss paper uh, which came out by Google uh, some years back and uh, they had an encodic model, a voice encoder model. We generated embeddings using that model uh, for each chunk, right? And then basically we did a density-based clustering for each audio source, okay? So premise being that similar speakers or the same speaker will be in the same cluster. And we tested this approach on a bunch of data sets we had from LDCIL or some other data sets. Uh, and we were able to see that this technique actually works. So this was a huge breakthrough uh, because now you can keep sense of some, uh, you know, how many speakers are present in a data set and uh, the more the better, of course. And uh, we also filtered in a sense that we didn't want a speaker bias in our training data so that if the if there's an audio, uh, it is uh, it is of the kind such that, you know, one speaker is speaking for more than an hour or more than 30 minutes. We basically only took maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes of that data max because we didn't want speaker bias in our ASR data. Okay. Then the next important thing was gender identification. So uh, this is also important. Of course, you want your model to have in an ideal world the same performance on a male voice or a female voice, right? Uh, so we basically needed some sense of what is going in our model, right? The, the more you know about data, the more you can predict the model performance is how I say. Uh, so what we did was we created embeddings uh, again from these chunks of audio uh, using the same encoder model. And on, on those embeddings, we trained a support vector machine classifier simple. And we were able to see that, uh, that it, it was able to distinguish between male and female voices uh, in, a, in a great way. So using these simple tools, uh, which were already open source, maybe by some some other people, maybe just tweaking them, uh, we were able to you know uh, just make this pipeline very robust for data collection. Again, the chunk duration. Uh, what we thought, what we read in the paper was that uh, we, most of the experiments which I'll be talking about was using wave to vec two kind of ASR model. So this was a uh, basically a mo modeling paradigm which came in 2021, if I'm not wrong, uh, by, by FAIR, Facebook Research. And they introduced basically uh, self uh, semi-supervised learning in the ASR space. And uh, that's why we chose it, because we don't have a lot of data in, in, in many Indian languages. So this is an end-to-end -end transformer-based model. And we, we, we saw that you don't need uh, larger chunks of audio, which would otherwise not fit the GPU. Also, some batches can be you know, a little tricky to train. So we basically adjusted the chunk duration, uh, which was going in at this stage. The next part is transcription, right? And uh, this is the tricky part. So uh, for, for some languages in which we saw that, you know, these uh, Google and maybe Azure ASR are generating good quality transcripts, 
we used these mod, uh, these commercial engines to generate some amount of transcripts. But we saw is that these these what we these are what we call pseudo labels, and they actually enhance AI's performance. We we saw that, and some data sets were of course uh, you know uh, available to us, and some some were available in the sense that you know audio and text was present, but they were not in pairs. So we had to align them. So get doing a bunch of these things, we were able to generate a lot of data for many, many languages. So the next game, uh, CALS RIL 23, as we call it, uh, which is cross-lingual speech representations for Indic languages. As I was talking about that, we most of the times used wave to vec 2 kind of models to train our models. And why we did that was because this, this model modeling paradigm uh, uses something known as semi-supervised learning, and it is able to learn robust representation of speech just from audio itself. So what it means is you don't need a lot of audio data plus text data to train your models in the first stage. And when you fine tune, you basically just need a little bit of, you know, label data, and we were able to get good performance from it. So what we did was we took 23 is the number of Indian languages we took. Uh, we curated around 10,000 hours of data in 23 languages, and we did a massive pre-training. Uh, at that time, it was the first of its kind for Indian languages. And uh, we basically also open sourced this model, but we also saw that if we keep that model as our backbone, our ASR models we, uh, were very good, even with almost you know 100 hours of data or 50 hours of data. So to train end-to-end -end networks, Previously, you need to have almost, you know, uh, 4,000 hours of data or 5,000 hours of data for a single language. And that is, of course, not possible uh, if you don't want to spend a lot of money, right? Uh, but using this semi-supervised technique, uh, you can get very good uh, ASR models with SOTA quality with just maybe a couple of hundred hours of data. And that was really a paradigm shift for most of us uh, that we were able to get very good models with less amount of data. So uh, this is an interesting plot. Uh, so basically, when we trained this model, we wanted to see whether this is making any sense to us or not. So what I did was basically I took this model. I extracted its embeddings for different different languages, uh, projected them on a lower dimensional space, and you know did a clustering. And what we see here is that similar sounding languages are sort of falling in the same cluster most of the times, which is good to know. Uh, that means that our model was able to learn some robust representation of speech. You see here that same color uh, denotes same cluster. We see that here, Assami, Bengali, Odia, they fall in the same cluster. I, I hope they sound similar. Uh, may, more Many people can tell me that if, if this is wrong. Uh, Urdu, Hindi, Sanskrit, Punjabi, they sound a little similar that I know. And these are also falling in the same cluster. So we saw that this model is able to generate embeddings, which uh, encode phonetic information within the embeddings, and that was a good sign. So we took this model as our backbone, and we were able to train uh, many uh, fine-tuned models for 23 languages in a very short span of time. So before I delve into the results of what uh, what uh, what were the WERs we, we got for many languages, I just wanted to uh, just discuss on uh, testing strategy. Uh, when you, when when we are de developing ASR models, uh, we sometimes get very carried away and uh, try to optimize WER, you know, maybe on one data set or two data sets. And if we get a very good WER, we, we think that that model is very good. But when we deploy it, we see that, okay, it's not so good. So why does that happen? And, and, and I see this happening in, in a lot of places. Current, only recently, some papers have started addressing it. So one of my go to things is don't bask in the glory of one test set. Okay, so if you have one test set, and if you get a very low WR on that, and uh, you haven't tested on other test sets, it's okay, it's good, but you never know it, how it might turn when you deploy it. Okay, so the key to developing good ASR models is to collect as many diverse test sets as possible. Okay, and uh, what I mean by that is that if you have diverse test sets, so they will contain different kind of maybe informations within them, uh, what we call as data distribution. Some may be containing some accent, some may be containing one gender, some may be containing some age group, right? 
all these things contribute to your ASR model performance uh, or affect your ASR model performance rather. So you should collect as many different test sets as possible to see the true performance of your ASR model. Sometimes you can, what you can do is you can augment your data uh, to simulate test conditions wherever possible, right? Uh, audio manipulation is fairly easy with any programming language. You can add reverb, echo, you can add background noise, right? Just to see how well your model is performing uh, in these conditions, if you're not able to get data in those conditions in the first place, right? So you should test your ASR models very thoroughly in that case. And once you do these things, you will identify gaps. You will see uh, that, okay, your model doesn't work so well in a noisy environment, what to do about it? Okay, your model is not working so well for maybe a male voice. Okay, what to do about it? Uh, so these are the things which I suggest everyone should do if they are developing models which are uh, which need to be deployed somewhere for people to use, right? Uh, functional testing is as important as, you know, testing on test sets. What I mean by functional testing it, you deploy the model somewhere and you speak on it, okay? Nothing gives you more information uh, about your model than speaking on your own model, okay? We were able to find so many issues uh, just by doing these kind of things. Uh, and we saw that, you know, many issues can be deployment related, but they they somehow somehow deter the ASR performance. One thing we found that, okay, different Bluetooth headsets actually encode, you know, uh, audio differently when they are, you know, communicating with the computer. And we had to write different sampling algorithms so for, for those to work. So these are the kind of things which you won't know if you, if you don't test, right? And one thing we also found was that we developed a Kandala model. And for, for a bunch of speakers, the feedback was very good. Uh, but with other bunch of speakers, the feedback was not so good. And what we found was that the people who were speaking that a Kannada model was not good uh, were actually from North Kannada, Karnataka. And uh, then we got to know from a language expert that actually North Karnataka speaks a very different kind of Kannada. So these are the kind of things you get to know if you uh, deploy your model, ask people to test it out, test it out yourself. Uh, otherwise, you won't catch these things by testing with a single data set or test set. Right. So once we did this, uh, we made our models very robust. And these are some three uh, benchmarks which are publicly available. Uh, so one is Microsoft, 40 hours of data in three languages. One is MOOCs 2021. Uh, this is interspeech data set. And this is, and one is IITM English data, Hindi data, and Tamil data. Uh, so in all these three, and you see languages here in which this data is present. Our models were, were better than Google and Bing. Uh, these, I should comment that this was almost one and a half years ago. So there might be some changes in the models, but at that time, uh, that this was the statistic, okay? Our WRs were better in every language by far. And we developed not just models in these major languages. We were able to develop models in many other languages like Odia, in Urdu, uh, in Marathi, in uh, Maithili, in Dogri, in many languages, in Assamese. Uh, and you see that for many of these languages, Google doesn't even have a model. So Google doesn't even have a model for Punjabi, right? So this is where we are if you, if you rely on uh, big tech uh, to solve speech problems. Uh, we also developed models for Nepali, Bhojpuri, and Rajasthani. And through our forums, we got to know that a lot of university students in Nepal actually started using our toolkits and uh, our data and models to train their own models. So that was good to know. Uh, we also uh, competed in a lot of ASR competitions. Uh, so there were English ASR challenge. There was an Indian ASR challenge, uh, which was hosted by IIT Madras Speech Lab. I think we were the winners in one in some categories, but we were in top five in, in, in others. Uh, we also participated in the multilingual speech recognition and code switching challenge in at inter uh, interspeech uh, in 2021. In both cases, we were top 10 as well. Uh, so using just the tools and techniques, what we have, uh, you have the same ability to, uh, you can just download our models, use it, see them for yourself. I just want to comment on one thing, uh, which is low resource ASR. So you, you, you uh, I, I showed you uh, basically models like Dogri, Maithili, uh, and uh, Rajasthani, 
so let alone models there's no there was no even data present for them okay so uh, we did something we tried some experiments to basically create data for these languages i'll just briefly talk about it and we, then we trained asa models on top of them so what we saw was that uh, news on air which is the air all india radio news bulletins have uh, audio bulletins in a lot of languages because they are present in every state and they also have their respective bulletin in pdf format so most of the times it's verbatim but most of the time it's uh, sometimes it's not okay so what we did was that we chose languages like mathili bhojpuri and dogri uh, because they were phonetically similar to hindi and also they use the same uh, devanagari script uh, surprisingly i didn't know that uh, but they use the same devanagari script to write so what we did was we scraped this audio and pdf bulletins uh, we developed a pipeline to you know scrape text from pdf uh, and that is something I can, i can talk about in detail but that was not the point so what we did was that using a hindi tts model uh, because the script is the same uh, right bhojpuri letters are the same we were able to generate audio in hindi and it was close enough that it sounded like mathili bhojpuri and you know other languages we were able to align these using force alignment uh, using an algorithm called uh, dynamic time warping so using hindi tts we created pseudo labels in speech and aligned uh you know audio for mathili bhojpuri and dogri and what we saw was that actually these models perform okay they were not bad to start with uh, for these languages actually there was no data present uh, so let alone models and we were able to create data and models for these languages as well so we were able to create almost 50 hours of data in these three languages and here are the wer uh, is, is the wer for all these so that was the asr part uh so we all know that output from asr is good to see but if you want to actually use it uh, you know a lot of work needs to be done on that so direct output is seldom useful is what we saw that a lot of uh, people who are testing out a models they say that okay this is just some bunch of text i don't know what to do with it okay so we created a lot of tools and uh, utilities to enhance asr output what we so i'll talk about these four things uh, automatic punctuation inverse text normalization uh, domain adaptation and multilingual subtitling okay one by one so in automatic punctuation what we mean is that usually the it, at least in our case the models which were outputting text devoid of any punctuation so they didn't have any punctuation and suppose you are speaking for on the mic for almost one minute and you have a blob of text let on a machine even you won't understand what you spoke if you don't have punctuation right so we needed to solve this problem so this is basically the architecture we used uh, we used a back end of elbert encoder which is a indic bert model released by air for bharat uh, that's another research uh, group working in iit madras with a lot a lot of students and professors right and uh, we posed this problem as a, a sequence labeling task right and uh, you have some text here which may be which says wikipedia par kitna bharosa kar sakte hain it goes in a sub word tokenizer it passes on through you know albert encoder and basically then we have added a layer on top of it uh, which is a linear layer plus softmax for each character each word in, uh, in the in, in the sentence uh, which predicts that what punctuation should come after that and that includes a blank so that's how we designed this uh so you see that using this by first we train it and then you infer on it usually the uh, uh, in this sentence there should be a question mark uh and yeah so that that comes out so that was the basic architecture inverse text normalization is a little different uh than automatic punctuation in the sense that it doesn't include any punctuation but it enhances the output in other ways so if you have numbers or you know maybe some abbreviations or maybe some addresses which have some you know full forms or you know things like that you want to uh, consolidate the output so that it is more readable to humans so let's say you have something like i owe him 2000 dollars it if it comes out written like this on top which is a dollar sign in 2000 it is more readable right uh, this is just word to numbers but uh, what we used was something known as basic finite state transducers 
we basically wrote grammar rules for 12 indic languages not just for numbers but for currencies for time and what not and that greatly enhances the asr output for the reader okay so uh, that is open source as well this is what i mean by inverse text normalization the other things are domain adaptation and multilingual subtitling so what happens is sometimes these language models are not able to capture domain specific words uh, because sometimes you you train a general asr model and there are some many very complicated words which might not come out very well uh, so we developed something to extract automatic keywords from the text uh, there are many techniques uh, which are available and uh, what we did was we decoded these uh, our asr transcripts uh, audios using hot words what we call as uh, basically you boost the probability of these extracted words which are useful for a particular domain while decoding so that they come out you hope that it comes out well uh, which was not coming well otherwise okay i i'll give an example of this but basically it's artificially boosting of some hot words you have identified while decoding okay uh, and we saw that it actually makes a difference if you are using your asr models in a domain uh, in a specific domain scenario okay what we also did was multilingual subtitling uh what it means is uh so uh, most in indians as uh, as i already said that most most of us are at least bilingual if not trilingual right uh and if you listen to a news show or a podcast or you know things like that people mix hindi and you know some other language in between or hindi or english or maybe you know whatever uh, two languages in between so in that case what happens is if you use a monolingual asr model the transcription quality is not so good right maybe one speaker is speaking in hindi one is speaking in english you don't know what to do what what model should you use to transcribe this audio right so uh, we developed something known, known as multi, oh, called multilingual subtitling that if you pass in an audio and you specify which languages that audio contains uh, we can generate the subtitled file of that audio uh, in those particular languages okay so it would be i'll show an example of this but uh, this is uh, what is multilingual subtitling how we were able to do it was that you first break down the whole audio into voice chunks uh, so you take chunks which have voice activity now you generate transcripts using both the models okay suppose that the audio contains hindi and english you take these two models and you generate transcripts for each voice chunk now the assumption here is that the chunk contains one single language uh, and that's an assumption uh, works sometimes if, th if there's another uh, basically requirement this you can tweak that uh, but now you have to see that in the voice chunk uh, you have hindi text and english text you have to for each voice chunk you have that now it's a problem of text selection so what text should you select uh, for each each voice chunk right uh, so what how we did was we basically took a language model a uh, knlm based language model which is a statistical language model and we scored the text for each chunk and we took the one which had less perplexity uh, according to you know language model scoring and uh, we were actually blown away by the output of this uh, you could do multilingual subtitling using this it is in a single pass uh it is not real time uh but uh, some some things can be done to make it real time so we have developed these tools and techniques for 12 indic languages uh because we had data only in these 12 of them uh all the major indian languages are contained and the domain adaptation and multilingual subtitling are actually language agnostic so these are tools we developed which are language agnostic so you can use these tools for any language not just 12 so let me just show you uh if i i'll have to maybe share my uh a window of my uh video for you to hear the sound of it let me know if the sound is audible so this is an audio uh which contains uh, a speaker speaking in hindi and english both 
it's a podcast called market mantra so it's in finance domain also and uh, basically we were able to do multilingual subtitling on this kind of audio so you will understand what i meant by multilingual subtitling let first let me play this video Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Market Mantra, the program in which we give you a complete update on the economic, business, and stock market news of the day. My name is Veer Ravi Kumar, and with me is my co-anchor in Hindi, Sonu Sood. Thank you, Veer Ravi. Namaskar, Shwetao. Market Mantra में आपका स्वागत है. रोज की तरह आज भी हम देश और दुनिया से आर्थिक, व्यापारिक और शेयर बाजार के ताजा समाचार आप तक लाएंगे और उन पर चर्चा करेंगे. चर्चा के लिए स्टूडियो में आमंत्रित है वरिष्ठ आर्थिक विशेषज्ञ जयंतो दास. जयंतो नमस्कार. कार्यक्रम में आपका स्वागत है. और अब हेडलाइंस के साथ है बी रवि कुमार आरबीआई हाइक्स रेपो रेट बाय 40 बेसिस पॉइंट्स टू 4.40 परसेंट एल आई सी लॉन्च इज इट्स आई पी ओ फॉर जनरल पब्लिक टू रिमेन ओपन टिल द नाइन्थ ऑफ दिस मंथ डोमेस्टिक स्टॉक्स डिक्लाइन मोर देन टू परसेंट सेंसेक्स क्लोज बिलो फिफ्टी फाइव थाउजेंड सेवन हंड्रेड मार्क्स निफ्टी सेटल बिलो सिक्सटीन थाउजेंड सेवन हंड्रेड लेवल एंड ब्रेंड क्रूड प्राइसेज हॉवर अराउंड हंड्रेड नाइन डॉलर पर बैरल मार्क भारतीय रिजर्व बैंक ने रेपो दर में 40 आधार अंकों की बढ़ोतरी कर दी इसके साथ ही रेपो दर चार दशमलव चार सो यू सी व्हाट आई मीन सो देर वर टू स्पीकर्स हियर वन वाज स्पीकिंग इन हिंदी वन वाज स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश एंड इन अ सिंगल पास वी आर एबल टू जनरेट ट्रांसक्रिप्ट फॉर यू नो ईच ईच स्पीकर सो दीज आर ऑल मोनोलिंगल मॉडल्स दैट मीन्स दैट ट्रेंड ऑन सिंगल लैंग्वेज बट वी डिड सम लैंग्वेज मॉडल बेस्ड filtering on the text to select the appropriate chunks for each voice voice chunk yeah let me go back and present my presentation yeah so that was all about utilities uh so in the end i want to talk about some things which we have been working for the past in the past maybe 6 7 months so these were all wave to vector models uh, they are very very good in terms of transcription quality uh, but what we saw is that they are also very difficult to deploy uh, if you want to deploy them at scale uh, they consume a, they want a lot of gpu memory uh, they are expensive to deploy that means and uh, sometimes the throughput is not what you would want in a real time scenario so recently uh, conformer kind of models came out uh, by uh, by by some researchers and it, it has been ad adopted to many toolkits now so we basically uh, tried to train some a bunch of conformer models uh, we actually collaborated with nvidia uh, this time and we uh, created the biggest corpus which contains 34000 hours of audio data in 39 indic, indic languages and we did a massive pre training uh and this pre training checkpoint is available now uh, in open source domain on vakyansh models page uh, anyone can take it use it to train their own fine tuning models uh, we have also released a bunch of fine tuning models others will be uh, due in course and uh, what's the good part is that you can use this pre trained checkpoint to train ctc or rnnt kind of here some models so these are some model types uh, which you, you might have heard about so you can use these uh, use this checkpoint to uh, train these kind of models as well also uh, what i have been working on uh, in the past let's say even 2 3 months is uh, called forced alignment uh, so so this is just a depiction of what it means so you have a given audio and text okay uh, just it goes inside something okay it's a processor and basically what you have in the end is time stamp information for each word maybe for each phoneme and for each character possibly so if you have these three things you can uh, use these uh, use this information to to do a lot of other things like train very good quality tts models or you know some I, i'll show you something which we developed uh, so the challenge was that in again uh, so forced alignment is a long problem which has been there in the speech community for a lot of years uh most of the toolkits and things which are developed uh, for post alignment uh, require some asr model in the back and they do some you know uh, hmm kind of modeling to align these uh, or dtw dynamic time warping we 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 tried and tested a lot of these uh, toolkits but we saw that the quality of the post alignment was not so good so the thought was that if we have such good asr models why don't we use them for 
you know, forced alignment as well. And uh, then we started using something known as CTC segmentation. Actually, this came out very recently uh, in the last year. Uh, so it uses these end-to-end -end, uh, ASR models uh, basically to create frame-wise probabilities and then use it, uses a, a dynamic programming algorithm to find the most probable path uh, along, along the whole, you know, uh, tallies. So basically, uh, we are using our own models, our end-to-end wave-to-vec models for uh, forced alignment. And uh, basically, uh, they give much refined word boundaries. They are giving much better character boundaries. And you can actually... Uh, test this out for yourself as well. So this has been integrated in something known as Chitralekha. So I was doing this work uh, in conjunction with some researchers in IIT Madras uh, with AI for Bharat. So uh, Chitralekha is basically a subtitling tool, an open source one, uh, which they are developing. And uh, they needed some, you know, forced alignment capabilities in that, uh, basically the whole, whole, whole toolkit. So uh, a lot of things were done, uh, but and I was able to develop this API uh, for forced alignment for 12 Indic languages. Uh, so if you go to this page here, you can see that uh, this is already open sourced inside Chitralika backend. I've linked it uh, so you can see all the models are already there. You can basically just copy the instructions and start forced alignment. So. Uh, you can see here that you can give a sample audio file and text and it, it will give you the word and time boundaries and the probability score for the text present in this audio. Right. So that has happened. Uh, now I also want to show you uh, what we used it for. So a lot of times when you are uh, developing content for children's learning, uh, so they need so they needed something for you know, word highlighting as the speaker is speaking so that the child, the child knows what word to follow, right? Uh, it's, it's a fairly trivial problem, but it's difficult to solve. So Chitralekha, using Chitralekha, we were able to get very accurate uh, forced alignment boundaries, right? Uh, and we pass these boundaries in, in, in the YouTube subtitling, uh, basically framework. And I'll just open this video and it will play the audio okay it's not so useful now but you will see here that uh, when the speaker is speaking this is what i mean by the word is being highlighted okay this is very useful for children and uh, this is in the back end using our post alignment boundaries using ct6 segmentation and uh, what we did here was for Indian languages and our, all our models are for Indian languages, 12 Indian languages. So they work very well, actually, uh, even for uh, English accent in Indian English accent. Uh, basically, you can just take these models out of the box and generate very accurate uh, word level and phone level boundaries. So this is all I had. Uh, I hope uh, I was able to <laughs> capture some of your attention to talk about this. Uh, so we have been doing this work for the past three years. Uh, this was, I tried to condense a lot of it in, in, in one hour. So I think 10 minutes are left. If any one of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Hello, Anirudh. Hi, hi, Shisha. yeah. Yes. So uh, I'll uh, thanks for your uh, wonderful presentation and you uh, like Xtep and uh, this Bakayang's project is very much needful for uh, Indic languages if you want to build any uh, anything on that anything speech technology maybe ESR DTS or uh, like that. So thanks for uh, that great presentation. So now actually uh, we will take. Uh, Questions from uh, first, we'll take questions from uh, our YouTube chat box. Mm -hmm. So I'll read out. So mm -hmm. after that, you can maybe answer that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first question is from uh, it is from Ovisek. Mm -hmm. So he, he told like uh, it, it is a wonderful work. So I had a query mm -hmm. since you had data from different sources. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. What measures did you take while separating train validation and test sets? Okay, uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, so, so when we had data from different sources, we know that it was coming from a particular you know source, like uh, like some someone's speech, or you know some website, or you know some uh, some other uh, speaker because we also embedded speaker information when we were you know processing data in that pipeline so what i would suggest is what works best is if you want to understand the true quality of your asr model test it on unseen the unseen speakers uh, which are not contained in the training set and if you are able to uh, basically separate on information uh, which uh, which uses acoustic environment as well e either manually or you know uh, using some tools do that as well but speakers is the bare minimum. Uh, try to ensure that you don't have speaker overlap in your training tests and in your eval set uh, when you are training such models. Because that can, if you have a speaker leak in your data, uh, you will get some performance which is not a benchmark of what uh, of of what when you will deploy it. Because then you will test on your voice or your friend's voice, and it will not be as good, and it will give you a false sense of imp impression that it was good. So. I hope that answered the question. Uh, thank you, Anirudh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, second question is also from Avishek. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any specific study mm -hmm. to the train validation test data distribution capturing different dialects mm -hmm. from the Indic languages you considered? Uh -huh. So, in my knowledge, there has not been uh, many studies in this uh, because uh, I was I was talking of talking about the number of test sets and eval sets you have in public domain in Indian languages is very less. Uh, and we have so many languages, right? Uh, you have maybe just one set or, you know, two sets uh, for, you know, Hindi or you have some for Tamil now. Uh, recently, a lot of universities are releasing data and that's very good to know. Uh, I think uh, IIIT Hyderabad open source some data in Telugu, ISC Bangalore also did for Tamil, Telugu and Kannada. So it's good that a lot of universities are now coming into this and contributing data. But since when you are reporting your results in a paper, you want to do it on a data set which one can verify. And that becomes a challenge because then you just have maybe, you know, one or two data sets. Uh, so uh, that is one thing. But if you want to look at, so in the Indian context, I at least I haven't seen. Maybe recently some paper has come, which I'm not aware about. Uh, but for English, uh, there you can read it. Uh, so the recent Whisper paper, which came out by OpenAI, uh, they have a very big section on this. Uh, and they actually test uh, their models on several English benchmarks. And they saw uh, that some of the wave to wave models, which were getting you know 2 WER or less than 2 WER in five minutes of data on Libri speech, they were actually pretty bad in, in other data sets. So uh, at least that paper talks about it. But in the Indian language context, I'm not so aware about it. Okay, and thank you. So uh, Adirudh, continuation of this question. Uh, yeah. uh, like, uh, did you check uh, the acoustic space for like uh, whatever the representation you got from the web 2 vec especially? Uh -huh. uh, so uh, whatever the representation you got, so did you plot somewhere like uh, based on uh, dialects, maybe Hindi or Tamil, Telugu? Yeah. Or like whatever you did for uh, language. So for dialect, we didn't do, no. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, so again, so it's a process of, again, you have to label some data for that, right? Uh, and that, that becomes a challenge because you have so much data and then you need a language expert who can say that this is this dialect. And if you have this information, uh, you can definitely do it. I think a lot of you are in universities, you might have access to such data, so you can definitely use uh, that model to benchmark these things. Okay, thank you. So this is very interesting to see, I think. So yeah. anyone interested can see that. Yeah. So uh, then uh, I actually, uh, I have one question. Uh, uh -huh. So I posted in uh, YouTube chat book. Uh, now uh, for a new learner, can uh -huh. you give some insight, like uh, if he has, he or she has some uh, maybe 10 to 20 hours of data, because some low resource languages, we may have correct. very less amount of uh, data, which is there in open source. Open correct, correct. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, can you give some idea, like how to build on a ASR model on that particular 10 to 20 hours of data using this conformer or web to web based correct. model? Correct, correct, correct. So yeah, so we saw that even with 
10, 20 hours of data, we were able to get very decent performance. Actually, our model, which is in Punjabi, which is deployed, is trained on very less data. It's less than 50 hours. So if you have very less data, uh, but it contains, you know, uh, a lot of speakers, uh, then it can actually be uh, work very well. Uh, so just to, if you are doing it for an academic project and it contains just one or two speakers and you want to test it out, it will train, but it might not work very well for your voice. Uh, but if you can increase the speaker diversity, uh, even in 10 hours of data, uh, you can actually get very good models. So for how to start is basically we have open source these large pre-training checkpoints uh, for wave to wave kind of models and both conformer models, right? Take these as your backbone and then fine tune using our toolkit on, on, on your 20 hours of data. And uh, trust me, you will get uh, like even 20 hours of the speaker diversity is uh, is good. Uh, you, you will get a model which will work on your voice and your friend's voice at least. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one question uh, from YouTube uh, chat box. So we have a couple of questions in the road. So maybe, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. No problem. So, yeah. So uh, he asked like, uh, his name is not there actually. Uh, uh -huh. So can we build multilingual model using uh -huh. the latest last large model without mm -hmm. language identification? Should we have to give mm -hmm. all the characters in unit file? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't understand the last part. So mm -hmm. he's asking about uh, can got we it. build multilingual model without language identification? Got it, got it, got it. Uh, so that is something we actually tried. Okay, so the easiest thing to build a multilingual model is, let's say you want to mix two languages, uh, let's say Bengali and English. And uh, the easiest thing to do is you take the union of the characters of these two languages, and uh, you just pass in the audio and transcript, the label transcripts you have, you mix the training data and you train one model in the hopes that it will, for Bengali model, uh, give you Bengali and for English model, it will give English. So it, it so what we saw, actually, we did the same uh, for code switching challenge in, at InterSpeech. And it was for English and uh, Bengali, actually. Uh, so we saw that it is not so robust. OK, so if you just mix the character set and train one model, it will give you a model which will be English sometimes and Bengali sometimes. But it will also be wrong many times, is what we saw. Uh, so to, to, to circumvent that, you, you have to do some, some of your own building. What you can do is basically you can add another layer on top of your uh, CTC, a linear layer uh, which with a softmax function, which basically is a multi softmax at the end, which tells you uh, that, okay, this is the language, this is the transcript. So conditioned on language. And I think there are many papers uh, which, which talk about this. Uh, but if we just combine the character sets uh, and train one model, we saw that it was not very robust in, in multilingual scenario. OK, OK. I uh, hope uh, the person got that answer. So uh, we have another question from Struti. Mm -hmm. How to incorporate numbers in training data? For example, if mm -hmm. we have many numbers in our uh, data set. Correct. Uh, that's a very good question. So when we first started training, actually, uh, so I was also new to, you know, a lot of ASR techniques and uh, text years back. And we trained a model with numbers present. That is the number uh, in number written uh, without the word form. And there's a problem with that. The problem is that uh, how, the, how many number combinations are there? They, they are infinite, right? You cannot train an ASR model, which will output uh, numbers uh, by just, you know, giving them in training data. So what we did was we normalized all of our uh, basically uh, training data such that it didn't contain numbers, it contained words. So if it is Ek Hazar Bara, it was written in words, not numbers. And now what you can do is, uh, so these are limited, right? I mean, the, these combinations are limited, not not not, you know, not infinite. And once you have this these words in your ASR output, and we developed these inverse text normalization techniques to convert these back into numbers. So that is a much saner route to take if you are if you want your ASR to be very accurate on numbers. Otherwise, if you don't treat the numbers in your training data well, uh, your model will output some numbers when you speak something else. Uh, that is what we saw at least. OK, uh, thank you. So we have another question uh, from Sikha Bagel. Hi, Unirud. Uh, very good work. 
you mentioned about multilingual scenarios for ASR. So she has one question actually. Uh, I am wondering uh, how to select an optimum segment duration for mm -hmm. quote mixing cases where one or two words from foreign language is mm -hmm. present in a native language sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so in our multilingual scenario, uh, we, we assume that at least, you know, one chunk contains a, a language which is, uh, it contains a single language, it doesn't contain two languages. But if it's a code mix scenario, then it's a little different. Uh, then uh, it, the, your segment can contain, you know, some foreign words. Now the question is, do you want those words to come out in the same script uh, as that language or it can work with you if it comes out in a different script? For example, if we are mixing Hindi and English and we are speaking some English words with Hindi, so is it okay for you if those English words are transliterated in Hindi or you want English characters? That is the first question. Now the thing is like, if you, if you are okay with the English words coming out in Devanagari script, there are things you can do uh, to adapt your language model to, to basically uh, output English words also by treating, the, treating them as hot words or treating training your language model on a lot of English data. So things like that can be compensated. Uh, but uh, using a monolingual model to do code, code switching, uh, for, for us, it has not worked out so well. Uh, and I'm not an expert in code switching, so I don't know about, you know, the, what are the current state of the art methods to do it. Uh, but if you are able, or you are okay with basically outputting these uh, uh, words in, in, in another script, then you can tweak the language model and do it. Actually, our Hindi model, which we have open sourced, uh, the language model contains so many English words that it, it basically takes care of English. So you don't have to worry about it almost all the time. Uh, so things like that, that can be done. Okay, I think uh, see niche in different script. So mm -hmm. English would be in English, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, for that, uh, there are a lot of literature. We didn't de de develop something like that, but there are some frame level uh, classifiers which one can develop on which there's another, instead of the softmax on the whole audio chunk. Uh, so there, there's a frame level classifier for each you know frame in the audio and then you are outputting based on that, but I'm, I, we haven't developed such models, so I won't comment on that. Thank you. So mm -hmm. we have uh, the, those questions from YouTube chat box. Mm -hmm. Now we have actually, we distributed uh, a Google form. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to this session, so from that actually we have a uh, few questions. So mm -hmm. I'll read out that. Yeah. So first question is from Sandeep Das. Uh, mm -hmm. So he, he asked, uh, please share some insights mm -hmm. regarding the uses of phonetic, phonetic keyword, key, uh, phonetic keyboard for Indic language. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that can, yeah. Uh, phonetic keyboard for Indian languages. Uh, so that means like instead of using a, a basic, uh, this keyboard, you want to use a separate keyboard for uh, typing Indian languages. Uh, I, yeah, not I think so. yeah, yeah. I, okay. I've not used it myself. Maybe people who type uh, Indian languages on a daily basis, those will be the best people to answer such question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have, uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, let me check who asked actually. Come on second. One second. Um, So, yeah, so he is from Rust, uh, he is from Mumbai, uh, mm -hmm. Rustam Fesania. Mm -hmm. So he asked the first question, how can we contribute to Vakyangs? Mm -hmm. Does it have internship role available for beginners in speech processing? Okay, uh, so uh, so currently this, uh, so you can of course contribute it, there is a pull request and I'll review it and you know your, your things will be available on our GitHub repo. Uh, that is the easiest thing to do actually. Uh, so it's completely open source, and at this stage, uh, there there are no act, there's no active work happening on that. Uh, it's only volunteer work that is happening on it. Uh, active work on this project actually step uh, stopped this uh, uh, this December. So, but uh, there are a lot of volunteers like me who are still connected with this project, and I am continuing currently maintaining it as well. 
so i don't think i'll be able to offer you an internship position but if you want to contact me uh, talk about ideas as to how to contribute to it or want some guidance into using such tools you can always use our github forums and raise a pull request there or even message me directly using linkedin or you know some other portals and i'll try to respond to to the best of my ability okay thank you so he has another question uh, mm -hmm. how was the wakyang team formed and created a, what's the end goal of uh, end goal vision yeah so uh wakyang team was formed 3 months 3 uh, years back actually so the, so the, the, there's a, there was a person uh called dr vivek raghavan uh, i think he he was that kind of mean uh he did the conception of this whole wakyang thing uh and he, he's a chief architect of adhar he he works in a lot of government uh related technology pro uh, projects and this 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 is funded by extra foundation as i told about and uh, me and dr vivek were in touch uh by by accident and actually we thought like why not do this and uh, i was at thoughtworks that time and we basically then started working on it with a small team uh, of data scientists like uh, we we were in the beginning we were like two two data scientists on this and then this team basically evolved and we had uh, two data scientists and you know two freshers and we also had then had a dev team which was building uh, crowd sourcing platforms uh, to to collect data so if you if you if you saw that in the recent uh released by pm modi the bhashini uh initiative that was all made uh almost like by my my dev team actually okay so that is the end goal uh to to empower everyone in india to speak in their languages so that was the end goal uh and that is still going on so yeah i hope that answers the question yeah thanks so uh another question like what is the difference between wakyang and hugging face yeah so hugging face is uh, uh, basically uh, it, it's a much broader it's very very broad uh, they are they so first of all it's a library uh, and then they are basically anyone can put models in anything right r is very focused indic languages only and speech only maybe some nlp also uh, but we are just focusing focusing on speech Uh, and we are open sourcing a lot of data as well which hugging face doesn't do most of the time uh, so we are just focusing focusing on speech and indian languages we are not as broad as hugging face uh, hugging face now has diffusion model stack to stack models they have everything uh, we are not a repository for deep learning models we are a repository and a whole ecosystem for speech technology in indic languages okay uh so another question from stum only uh, like who, who are doing a uh, great research and open source work in speech processing in india in india there are a lot of folks uh, i mean there are multiple groups present i think you can even share if you if you read his papers also uh, so there are a lot of groups in iit guwahati there are there are some professors in iit dharwar so uh, actually i was able to uh, basically get in touch with some professors there uh professor prasanna professor deepak at iit dharwad uh, in iit chennai there are uh, professor mitesh khapra professor pratyush uh, even at uh, iit hyderabad so every major university now has this speech thing going professor umesh in iit chennai uh, hema murthy ma'am tts so there are there's so many things happening you just have to look at publications and uh, see uh, like what, where they are coming from and then you will see a pattern that okay this this research group is doing so so great work okay yeah so uh, another question the last question uh, from google form mm -hmm. uh, what what are your thoughts on speech processing asr without using deep learning is it mm -hmm. still useful in certain cases or mm -hmm. having a good background is uh, in back, uh, in deep learning is mm -hmm. is it, uh, is required yeah. okay yeah uh, so that's a very good question and uh, actually that was the starting point for us also that what should we use so uh, if you don't use deep learning so there are these other methods which you can use and they have their own place uh, so if you want to develop asr systems uh, which want which work on you know certain speaker like the maybe the asr model on your phone it is trained to identify your voice work on your voice right 
uh, in that case even uh, not deep, uh, maybe not an end to end model just uh, you know a uh, simple hmm hybrid lstm something something can work uh, but if you are making a uh, trying to make a model which is as big in scope as us like a general asr which works for the indian population uh, in those scenarios i have seen that uh, these older techniques don't work so well uh, so in that case it's good to go for with end to end models which can learn a lot of uh, you know accents uh, speakers dialects and what not uh, but if your scope is limited if you want to use your asr models with a bunch of people or for yourself uh, in that case you can go with other tools and techniques as well uh thank you so yeah. regarding that uh, rustam question actually who are working on speech especially in india Mm -hmm. so uh, i can give you uh, give him one tips actually mm -hmm. like he can go to uh, rustam you can go to like uh, interspeech archive then you will get uh, every year interspeech papers there then you go to that proceedings and then you search by india then uh, whoever names uh, there are huge numbers of papers will be there every year so you can actually check like who, who are working in that particular area so that may be one way you can check definitely thank you so uh, anirudh we have mm -hmm. a last question actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, shruti asked that question mm -hmm. uh, this is regarding actually deployment because mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. uh, that we build a model but the problem is while doing the deployment correct so he is uh, she is asking uh, how to do the real time deployment mm -hmm. and what are the parameters to be considered for real time deployment Mm -hmm. how much is the time taken for influence for the mm -hmm. models you have tested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah 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 so yeah that's a very good question actually when we were uh, trying to deploy these huge transformer models we we also scratched our heads for months uh, so the, deploying these is not so easy uh, as everyone knows uh, so it back boils down to uh, you need to have multiple people on your team uh, maybe if you if you can learn everything then it's nothing like that uh, but a person who knows you know some back end engineering a person who can do some you know uh, devops uh, like you know, docker images and deploying them on you know maybe some cloud uh, so if you want to and maybe some front end knowledge as well uh, the, uh, and i know that this is a lot of technology but if you want to deploy it and use it on your browser uh, then you need everything uh so you first first you need uh, people with varied skill sets uh, or if you know everything then nothing like that the second is like deploying these deep learning models is uh, is fairly new for a lot of folks even in, in industry okay so you need to first you need to see what's the memory footprint of your model there are many ways to do this so when you are basically running your asr inference on a test set uh, you can actually monitor your gpu usage at that time and see how much memory is your model consuming okay so let's say uh, your current model our current models were actually around uh, 300 mbs then when they were loaded inside the gpus and with uh, when during the time of inferencing one model was taking around 1 to 1.2 gbs of memory and that is uh, so knowing that is important because those are the number of models you can load on the same gpu while inference right now the second thing to know is that how many users can this one model copy host without losing a lot of requests okay suppose suddenly 100 people come and you just have one model loaded on your gpu will that work or not you need to know that okay and if not uh, then how do you scale it okay so what you can do is basically you can write a api first uh, to to do just single inference and then you can test it out uh by increasing the number of concurrent users actually i have a blog post on it maybe i can share it with shishir who can share that with you uh on how to load test deep learning models but basically you need to know what is the number of what are the number of users your uh, model can support concurrently and once you know that uh, so suppose you once you know that you know one model copy can uh, support 12 concurrent users or 15 concurrent users now you know that okay these are the number of users i can support uh, using one copy so let's say if you want to deploy a service for 1000 people now you know that okay i need to do, uh, deploy how many model copies right so one is 12 one is maybe 10 so you need to deploy 100 100 model copies right 
and one model was taking 1.5 GB. So two models are taking 3 GB. So on a, on, on a one 8 GB GPU, you can have only four models, right? So you see the math. Okay, so th this is how you test actually the limits of your model inference, how much memory it takes, how much users it, you know, uh, support it in a, in a single go. And then you basically deploy it. Now deployment can happen on a lot of, uh, you know, inf in, uh, uh, infrastructure. We basically used Kubernetes, do the GPU sharing. So everything is an open source uh, in our repos. You can go have a look at the source code. Uh, but uh, I've just described the basic processes you should do before getting into deployments is to testing your GPU memory footprint. Uh, Anirudh, in continuation of that question, uh, uh -huh. like what is the uh, like CPU versus GPU inferencing? Correct. Okay. So these models uh, depends, you know, in what kind of scenario you want to use them. Uh, so at least the wave to vector models, we were seeing that they run much faster on a GPU instead of a CPU. So if you have some uh, requirement of generating a response real time or maybe without lag, then CPU is not an option in most of the cases. But if you have you know, a service which needs to run at some point of time to transcribe uh, and you want to see the results maybe the next morning or maybe after some hours, then even CPU is fine. But if you want to use it, these uh, deep learning models like wave to wake conformer models, uh, using them on the GPU is the way to go if you want uh, around real time performance. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is that like, uh, so we have a model, we train mm -hmm. maybe wave to wake model on Faraday CQ or maybe NVIDIA model. Mm -hmm. So we got a model and then uh, directly we can't uh, deploy that model. So what are the techniques we need to have applied like to converting maybe on X or maybe other things? So can yeah, you yeah. give some overview on that? Correct, correct, correct. So th there are a lot of, uh, so, so, so when you have your model, which uh, loads maybe on vanilla PyTorch, you know, and things like that. Uh, like Ashish had talked about, there are a multiple convergence which you can do uh, like ONNX conversion or you know, lower precision conversion or quantization. Uh, there are many things which one can do uh, to, to, to basically uh, increase the throughput or improve the deployment quality. Uh, in wave to vector case, we didn't do a lot of these things actually uh, because the model active architecture was so new, it is actually very tricky to convert to ONNX. So that also depends, like is your model architecture supported by ONNX conversion or not? What we did was we dropped every unuseful thing for us from the checkpoint. So we made them as light as possible. Okay. You don't have to save the optimizer state. You don't have to state the, uh, uh, save the shed learning scheduler and everything while you are uh, saving checkpoints for inference. You just need to have the bare bones model weights. So if you just have them and you drop everything already, you are shedding a lot of weight. And on top of that, if you can do things like quantization, ONNX conversion, uh, they will further reduce your uh, you know, model size. And hopefully, if you, if, you, if you have a small model size, you might be able to deploy it on a CPU as well instead of a GPU. Uh, with wave to vec 2 we didn't do it. Uh, but if someone of you can take it up and make that as a contribution, we'll be very happy to have that. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, a little bit. Uh... Uh, these are the questions from chat, uh, like uh, Google form as well as YouTube chat box. So we don't have any other questions. Uh, let me refresh once again so that, yeah. So Suti asks actually like, uh, if we don't have uh, a cloud option, then what we should do? Because if we want to do locally, like how mm -hmm. is it uh, effective? Locally training or deployment? Uh, locally deployment, locally local, deployment, local deployment. Uh, so, I mean, lo so local, the, the main bottleneck is the scalability and uh, the basically the bare bones of your laptop or whatever server you are using, right? If you are deploying it just to test it for yourself or maybe your lab or maybe some of your, you know, colleagues uh, at university, then even a local deployment is actually fine. You know, you don't need a lot of scale when you're testing out the model. Uh, you don't need cloud to test model for 10 people on a single GPU. You can do that even for 20 people. 
So depends like if you want to deploy it on a GPU or CPU. To first, I would suggest just go with the CPU if you don't have resources for a GPU. Uh, see whether that makes sense for you. Uh, otherwise, then try to deploy it on a GPU. But for for you know a handful of people uh, testing like ten people, twenty people, you don't need the cloud. Cloud is needed just for scalability uh, and you know things like that. But on even on a local server, you can deploy and use test out your models. Okay, okay. So just uh, an uh, idea. Uh, high level idea maybe mm -hmm. uh, if we have maybe 200 300 uh, or maybe thousands uh, concurrent hits at a time mm -hmm. so at that time it's better to go to cloud or like we can do in uh, locate itself so uh, that depends again like uh, how much compute you have at your local machine right if your local machine is a dgx machine with you know uh, 2800 gpus with 80 gps then you don't need to go uh, on a cloud right but if your local machine is your laptop with a 4GB GPU, then you do have no option but to go somewhere else, right? So it depends like how much uh, memory your, your local system has and, and the number of users you want to serve. It depends on that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Anirund. Actually, uh, we are about to... Uh, already we have uh, you answered all the questions. So, so th thanks for your wonderful presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, like XTEF did the excellent work, like providing these uh, models and data and open sourcing everything. So th thank you. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation for this presentation. So maybe hopefully again in future, we'll have another session from you uh, about your next, next work. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for inviting Excellent. me and thanks everyone for attending. So let me uh,